Hello and welcome to the fourth and final part of the Locker Room Talk series hosted by the YP Foundation. And uh, this time we have collaborated with the Internet Freedom Foundation to bring you uh, a conversation called Caught in the Web. And uh, before uh, I introduce uh, the moderator for the day, uh, just like to add one small point that uh, today we will be talking about certain topics such as uh, online abuse and harassment, uh, rape threats, etc. of nature of uh, sexual violence uh, that could act as a certain trigger for some people. So in a situation such as this, please feel free to step out of the conversation or mute yourself uh, if that helps and log back in whenever uh, you feel like. Uh, this discussion is also being recorded and will be put up on our Facebook page uh, later in the day. And if you would like to access it at that stage, uh, that'd be great. Uh, we have had three discussions over the last uh, one month in the context of the boys locker room incident to understand young people's perspectives on sex and, sex and sexuality, uh, what goes on in school spaces, how intersections uh, of multiple identities interact with each other and how we can reimagine uh, uh, justice and reform in school settings. Uh, after all these uh, discussions with a diverse set of speakers, uh, today we bring the topic uh, on online safety and surveilling of young people. Uh, just a note to our Facebook audience who are watching this right now, during the discussion, please do share uh, your questions in the comment section so that we can also take them up uh, in our discussion. I'd like to now introduce our moderator today. Uh, Dev Dutta is an associate counsel at Internet Freedom Foundation, where she manages the litigation vertical. Her areas of interest include strategic public interest litigation, constitutional law, and international human rights law. Uh, Dev Dutta, over to you. Hello everyone. As Sagar mentioned, I am Devdatta and thank you Sagar for that quite fancy sounding introduction. Um, I am a lawyer by training and I work at Internet Freedom Foundation. We are a digital rights advocacy group which has also been looking at some issues of online abuse and harassment in the last few months, especially in the aftermath of the boys locker room incident. I think on that note, I'd like to thank the YP Foundation for sort of taking the initiative to organize these series of discussions about the boys locker room incident and also what it reveals about our larger society and culture. I think the, with the number of things that are happening in the country, public memory is very short. So while there was a lot of outrage in the news and on social media after boys locker room happened, I think sometime in early May, the conversation often tends to die down. So I'm really glad that I have an opportunity to moderate this discussion today and sort of engage with this issue in a more substantive and sustained manner. I think I'm especially glad that we have a lot of people on board who have practical experience dealing with young people, dealing with issues of online abuse and online harm and can bring in those perspectives to the conversation. At IFF, our work has largely focused on the problems which exist in the legal and institutional framework for addressing cybercrime against women. And I'm sure a part who is our executive director and also participating in this conversation will discuss some of these issues later on in the conversation. But the goal of today's discussion is to also go beyond the law and to try and understand exactly how abuse and harassment manifest in different ways on uh, social media and other digital platforms, and to also understand how this kind of abuse and harassment is often disproportionately targeted towards women and other marginalized groups. I think it's important to recognize that women have been facing these problems of abuse and harassment since perhaps you know the first caveman was able to scrawl something on the walls of a cave. But the thing is that with advancement in technology, there are new forms of harms which are emerging. For instance, we've recently seen the rise in deep fakes. Deep fakes are extremely realistic looking mock images which are generated using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And now these deep fakes are being used by many men to perpetrate image-based sexual abuse against women in online spaces. 
so i think when there are new iterations of old harms which are enabled by technological advancement we need to recalibrate our vocabulary our thinking our strategies and sort of revisit how exactly we want to approach this unfortunately i think if we were to talk about the government's response to these problems the government's response has been un quite regressive and it is focused on more surveillance and more censorship to give you an example bans on consensual pornography are often justified by the government as a necessary measure to ensure women's safety similarly in the recent past we've also seen governments applying more pressure on technology companies especially to weaken encryption and weaken security so that law enforcement agencies can have easy access to user data now all of these are fairly complex and thorny issues and i hope that through the course of today's discussion we will be able to unpack some of these nuances so maybe let's get right into it i'll start with radhika radhika uh, if you can hear me yeah i can hear you okay great uh, radhika i was just wondering do you think uh, that violence that we see in the online sphere through the form of abuse or harassment it also mimics existing inequalities which are in our society along the lines of gender caste religion etc and if so what do you think are the ways specific ways in which these inequalities manifest in online space Hi uh so thanks a lot for the question and i think this is a very pertinent question for this conversation because uh we often notice that uh, a lot of the experiences that uh, are you know uh, observed in traditionally offline or physical spaces do get mirrored to a large extent in online spaces uh and one's identities from uh, your gender your caste your sexuality etc uh, all of them play a very crucial role in determining how that experience is uh so the power hierarchies that um, govern society in physical spaces uh, they also govern the internet um and one way to understand this is is that public spaces for example have always been historically the domain of men so women occupying public spaces has always you know been like a problem uh and the private domain of women uh is where women are considered to be like good women if you are a respectable woman you are a private woman but if you are a public woman the perception is that you are a sex worker or that you know you're not a good woman because you are out for no respectable purpose uh and this analogy applies even to online spaces because uh the fact that women don't have such free access to public spaces means that their experience there is moderated accordingly uh, so if you do venture out into the public spaces then you will face some sort of uh, you know backlash some sort of violence as a result of that so since uh, spaces themselves are so hierarchized in terms of gender caste class religion etc uh when women cross the boundaries of the spaces that they are uh, permitted to be in uh that's when there is violence as a form of backlash for it and that becomes also a form of surveillance which is another pertinent theme for today's discussion uh because surveillance itself is a uh, means to control people uh, and all of us are governed by some sort of implicit expectations of what we are supposed to behave like depending upon our gender our caste our religion etc uh, and these expectations also uh, you know carry on to the to the online space uh, and uh, as a result of this uh, if you deviate from the norms that women for instance are expected to follow like women are not supposed to go out at night or they're not supposed to uh, wear certain kinds of clothes or they're not supposed to put up pictures of them wearing certain kinds of clothes etc then they are punished for that digression from the norm uh so you know uh, and and also it's very very true that if you are a muslim woman or a dalit woman or a queer woman uh then these experiences are heightened so you have heightened violence that you see for some women than for others so uh the same way that we see these gradations in physical spaces they also carry on uh to online spaces and violence is a means of keeping women in their place uh and making sure that they follow the 
expectations that uh, society holds of them. Thanks a lot for that, Radhika. I was just wondering if Smita would like to maybe add to what Radhika has already said, because I know Point of View has done a lot of fantastic work on issues like the digital divide and also looking at specifically how women are impacted by technology. So Smita, if you would like to add to that and also maybe share a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself and your work. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm Smita. I work with an organization called Point of View that's based in Bombay. And I particularly work on the sexuality, technology, and gender uh, program. Um, and we do a range of things in the program, including um, on-ground workshops, research, uh, you know, taking um, grassroots, uh, like we work with grassroots communities, and then we take our learnings uh, from here to policy spaces as well as research. Um, Radhika answered the question fantastically, and I just wanted to add one or two things in that. Uh, you know, when Radhika was talking about the gender norms, which come from the offline onto the online space, um, that is a very, very big reason for um, why the online mimics inequalities from the offline space. And I think another thing which, uh, which I just want to flag is also that um, when you look at technology, when you look at internet, it's also a question of who is making the technology, who is making websites, softwares, uh, where are they sitting and making these, right? And why are they making this? And for whom are they making this, right? So sometimes, and a lot of times, because the people who are behind the scenes for technology, for, um, you know, different websites or uh, platforms, social media platforms, they never envisioned, uh, they, they, you know, for the most part are white men, cisgender men, straight men um, from global North countries. They wanted to expand to other countries because it's profitable, it's capitalist, and it, it, it benefits them immensely. But what they didn't think through is, is their software actually meant for people in other countries, right? And when that gap exists, the inequalities are then further amplified because there is no redressal mechanism that comes through. Um, another thing is also that, uh, another thing which I, I, I don't know, I always like, like bringing this up is that, you know, when the online space mimics the inequalities, I think in many, many ways, it also challenges the norms which are existing in the offline space, right? And because it's a, um, it's a world in where you still can carve out a niche for yourself, a little corner for yourself and talk what you have in mind. And you kind of like the, the kind of gatekeepers that you have to deal with has changed, right? And I think... Um, because I think the internet and technology, a lot of it is about pleasure and play and like just like explorations, right? And I think that is one of the things that um, the internet has also allowed for. So along, and, and I think this is something which we need to remember when we're talking about inequalities online, that it's not just a site of inequalities and violence, but also the site where you address these inequalities and violence. Uh, just that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Smita. I think it is very important for us to remember that the internet, as you mentioned, is just a medium and how it is used and for what purposes it is used really depends on the people who are using the internet and of course the kind of society that they belong to. I think I'd like to go next to Mansa. Mansa is somebody who I know has a lot of experience working with young people. And I was just wondering, Mansa, based on your expertise and experience, to what extent do you think young people are aware of and concerned about the risks which are involved in online interaction? And if they have such awareness, what are the precautions that they are taking, if any, to sort of mitigate these risks? Have you also maybe noticed things like people self-censoring to avoid abuse and harassment on digital platforms? And of course, please do introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and your work. Hi, um, I'm uh, Mansa. I, I'm actually a former employee of the YP Foundation. I currently work with uh, UNICEF and I am the adolescent and youth development specialist. Uh, what that actually means really is that I do engage with large networks of youth uh, on now, given the COVID context, primarily the online medium. Uh, and even as part of my, uh, you know, the programming that the adolescent and youth sexuality programming that uh, we did back in the YP Foundation, uh, we still do in the YP Foundation. Uh, uh, really, a lot of my job is to engage, has always been to engage adolescents and youth, build their capacities, 
advocate for their own rights. Um, I, I mean, your question, Devdatta, thank you for your question. I think the interesting things about, I mean, it's good to start off trying to understand the adolescent and youth constituency when we're really talking about the online space. Uh, and in my experience, um, and as data says it, uh, typically on an average adolescents and youth, uh, their risk perception is lower than the average risk perception of an adult or uh, an older adult, say somebody, you know, above the ages of sort of uh, 28, 29, 30, above the age of 30, uh, the average risk per perception of adolescents and youth is lesser. Uh, it is lower, why? It is lower because when one is engaging with the internet, especially adolescents and youth, uh, the cost benefit, sort of the benefit or the private gains that one stands to gain from the internet are plentiful and very sort of exciting especially for the adolescent and youth cohort, but I'm sure for the oldest cohort, older cohort as well, right? Of course, the, and this is not a blanket statement. Adolescent and youth is not a homogeneous constituency. It's a heterogeneous constituency. Like, uh, you know, marginalized adolescents and youth have been mentioned, marginalized identities have been mentioned by both Radhika and Smita. And for marginalized identities, typically risk perception is usually higher, simply because marginalized identities have experienced far more uh, you know, risky circumstances, challenges, backlash. Uh, so those communities are typically more sensitive to uh, uh, the risks of both offline and online space. But on an average, adolescent youth risk perception is lower than that of the adults. Uh, why? Because so very, I can give you, I mean, I can illustrate this through an example, right? Um, very recently, through our, the UNICEF is new report portal, we ran, uh, we ran a rapid assessment to understand what uh, has, what are the circumstances or what are the issues or concerns uh, that adolescents and youth have been uh, primarily sort of uh, bothered about during COVID, since the beginning of COVID-19. Uh, and one of the, not, I mean, the single highest concern that adolescents and youth have stated all across India, uh, the uh, survey poll sort of uh, surveyed around uh, 25,000 adolescents around on an average. And it is just, I mean, it's, it's very clear to see that social isolation is one of the biggest sort of fears or anxieties that adolescents and youth are undergoing at this point of time. Disconnection from their social networks, a feeling of, I mean, diminishing social belonging, right? And the lack of social validation. Why is this such an important thing in adolescents and youth's lives? Simply because a lot of the time, especially during that 10 to 19 age, you know, age uh, bracket, when you're growing up and you're asserting more autonomy over your body, over the decisions that you want to make for yourself, it is that you seldom find a, a rights affirming space within the household, right? So a lot of the time your peer networks and your social networks and your informal sort of safety networks are the spaces where you seek this support or the social validation or this, you develop this sense of social belonging. So that is one of the primary factors that's contributing to a lot of anxiety amongst adolescents and youth right now. So then one understands why, like Sinta pointed out, the digital medium can be such an opportunity for adolescents and youth to really develop and advance those social networks. Uh, now, that said, uh, one of the sort of important things to understand here is that while adolescents and youth risk perception may be low, their parental networks and their gatekeepers have very high risk perception, are always sort of anxious at this point. So a quick discussion with colleagues over the last couple of uh, weeks has told me that uh, colleagues are spending excessive time monitoring their adolescents and youth internet engagement monitoring it because they want to, they, they see, uh, they perceive really high risk for their adolescents and youth. And of course, the boys locker room conversation and the situation did sort of spike uh, levels of concern amongst, you know, parents. So they are spending significant time trying to monitor uh, their adolescents and, you know, their uh, children's online engagement. Um, and at this time, actually, it is interesting that one more important sort of um, landscape shift is taking place, right? Uh, most of your schools, which have been closed for a long time, educational institutions, both formal and informal. So including after-school learning centers, including healing centers that adolescents and youth used to access after school, uh, civil society run programs have all been closed off and discontinued. So quickly in, during this COVID time, what has been happening is a lot of kind of, kind of online migration of these programs, of educational institutions, of learning. Um, and in this migration, it's important to highlight that, uh, you know, a typical uh, actors, that there are a, a large variety of stakeholders who govern adolescents and youth lives who are now coming online, who have a significant presence online and who are trying to moderate or mediate adolescents and youth online engagement. 
uh, and this is throwing up interesting challenges because this means that uh, you are now reaching out primarily through an online medium or during an on-ground medium, your traditional trust building exercises or uh, processes, your traditional team building exercises and processes that uh, those processes that you had in place to increase the cohesion of these groups, adolescents and youth focus, focus groups, um, they are not going to be effective or they're not adequate on an online medium. Um, why? Simply because uh, on an on online medium where you're trying to galvanize random or collectivize random groups, groups of children or adolescents and youth, um, it is possible, entirely possible that they don't, I mean, they're, they're, uh, due to risk perceptions, they may not want to uh, reveal their personal data. And in order to protect their personal data, they may choose tools such as anonymity or pseudonymity. And these, I mean, I would imagine are uh, perfectly uh, acceptable forms of engagement uh, for adolescents and youth and for children, uh, especially those with marginalized identities who do not want to face backlash from unknown actors on your online platform. But that, uh, you know, that means that civil society organizations, educational systems are faced with the predicament of trying to navigate or trying to uh, build trust and sustain trust in a group of random actors who are now perhaps, uh, you know, not uh, uh, betraying personal, ide a personal identity uh, with good intention. But uh, it becomes challenging because if there is an actor that is, uh, you know, that, uh, that is causing some kind of discomfort to other participants in the group, that is uh, thwarting or, or uh, 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 you know, disrupting the safe space that adolescents and youth are trying to access in order to you know, um, uh, explore uh, their sexuality, depending on what the subject matter is, explore their sexuality, sexual and reproductive health, because typically uh, the YP Foundation also curates a lot of uh, sexuality education um, um, uh, online, you know, on the online medium. Uh, then we have, a, we have a problem because if there is a disruptor who is, um, anonymous, uh, how do you, uh, how does an organization like the YP Foundation or a UNICEF even, uh, you know, uh, ensure that the adolescent, uh, you know, attrition, the, you know, youth attrition doesn't take place, that people want to keep revisiting that medium. So it is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a new predicament and I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's been there, been around for longer, but, you know, it has uh, come into, uh, it, it has been accentuated during this uh, time of COVID. Thank you so much for that, Mansa. And I'm really glad that you brought up the issue of anonymity and how children are using pseudonyms or maybe anonymous accounts to avoid surveillance by their parents, teachers, neighbors, and pretty much every busybody which exists in Indian society. I'm just wondering what do all of you, and maybe I'll start with a part on this question, but I also want to hear everybody's thoughts on the relative anonymity that the internet as a medium offers. Because it's very often believed that the reason why we see so much abuse and so much harassment on the internet is because people don't really have to put a face or a name on it. And therefore, there's this culture of impunity and people think they can get away with saying or doing anything. But at the same time, as Mansa has mentioned, something like anonymity can also be very empowering for young people who are trying to avoid constant surveillance by those around them. So Apar, would you like to come in at this stage and please introduce yourself as well? Apar is the Executive Director of Internet Freedom Foundation and my boss, but he's been looking at these issues. I'm not. I'm, I'm Dave's colleague. I'm, Dave's <laughs> I'm here to play a supporting role. And thank you so much for that generous introduction. Um, just to start out, uh, the Internet Freedom Foundation has taken several steps towards protecting anonymity. So we have a very clear standard in terms of anonymity being a default technical standard which needs to be offered to people. But there needs to also be a process by which that anonymity may be removed. And there needs to be a very clear legal standard which needs to be fulfilled towards achieving that. Now, anonymity uh, on a systemic level quite often does result and I will acknowledge it and there's some science behind it as well in terms of engagements which cause a high amount of uh, online derision and that also then progresses towards really unfortunate experiences which are felt and perceived and actually directed towards women. Given that, as Radhika put it very well, Smita explained it towards a great length, and also Manasa said how younger people have a lower risk assessment. That uh, how these kind of conversations sometimes just uh, just just uh, lead to incredibly targeted forms of speech, which can uh, result in very deep psychological and mental uh, 
impacts, uh, usually negative. Now, um, anonymity at the same point of time needs to be considered in the rule of law framework we exist in India, right? Practically. And a lot of people today say that freedom of speech uh, by itself is very subjective. And yes, it is subjective because it depends on the power and privilege of the speaker. So for instance, I'm a CIS, um, a cisgendered man. I'm upper caste, I'm privileged. And the way I'm speaking, you know, I've had incredible privileges socially as well as um, in terms of knowledge. So the same statement that I, Apar Gupta, I'm, I'm making will usually not involve a level of threat, attack, or even legal prosecution where it may actually be directed towards any other person who may have several layers of um, uh, 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 may have several layers of identity as well as social privilege lacking due to that accident of birth and that's why uh, the standards which are there for free speech being subjective in its very operation by itself which we all fairly acknowledge and the rule of law framework not being the strongest in india we need things like anonymity in fact devdatta worked extensively on the right to anonymity for a person who was running a account to curate the disclosures made with respect to um, certain allegations of sexual harassment, which needed an online forum on Instagram with respect to uh, the art world. And I'll ask her to supplement that, where there was an actual real tangible need felt both by survivors of harassment, as well as the person who was running the um, account towards uh, making uh, sure that their anonymity is protected. And the Internet Freedom Foundation played a role there also as interveners, um, uh, as counsels who are acting with, with largely a, um, a team led by uh, women uh, litigators. So, um, uh, Dave, if you can just fill in some context there, it will be useful. And I think these are such broad comments by itself. Um, this is I think this kind of fits in both freedom of speech, surveillance, anonymity a fair bit and just ties it together. But this is all the remarks I had. I think people may be interested in the heard and seen case of it though, because it's a real factual instance of this occurring. Yeah, so I mean the case that Apar was referring to is actually not very different from what we saw during the Me Too movement and we saw a lot of this happening where women were anonymously posting accounts of sexual harassment that they had faced, often at the hands of prominent and powerful individuals. In these circumstances, anonymity is very important because if your identity were to be revealed, it's entirely possible that the person that you're complaining against will use uh, the knowledge of your identity to then retaliate against you and effectively ruin your career, etc. things like that. So in this case, uh, we had represented uh, a particular media organization which was uh, seeking uh, to ensure that reportage about these kind of anonymous allegations is allowed to remain available on the internet and that it's not censored by powerful plaintiffs who approach courts and then, you know, get like ex parte injunctions. But I also want to hear more about what uh, Mansa, Smita and Radhika maybe think about anonymity and because it's a double-edged sword really. It, it furthers and emboldens people to engage in abuse but it can also be a very powerful tool to call out abuse and hold people accountable. So if any of you would like to come in at this stage. I can go. Um, see the way I see anonymity is that it's like with other rights, right? Like when you use the right for your own uh, use, whatever that may be, that's one thing. But when you use this to oppress someone else or violate someone's consent or oppress on someone else's right, then like Apar said, there should be mechanisms which, with very clear standards on when this will be revoked from you, right? And I think another thing which I uh, personally feel very strongly about is also that I don't think anonymity should only be used for legit reasons or or or, or uh, reason because i don't think we should be creating a hierarchy in what is good reason for anonymity and pseudonymity and what are the not so good reasons right because this is a slippery slope um uh, when when we do workshop with um, young women and girls from 
uh, grassroots communities from cities everywhere. One of the things that they see, say often is that, you know, a lot of them are not allowed to use Facebook, uh, for example. And they're also not allowed to put up photos on Facebook particularly, right? And, uh, and this is forbidden by the male members in their family as well as their families. And they are constantly monitored and surveilled to make sure that this does not happen, right? Um, if you talk to their families, they would say this was a bad use of anonymity um, and pseudonymity. Is that, do we agree with that? No. So I think it's also essential that we don't create hierarchies in what is good and bad use of anonymity. One is that. And two, there is no question that Anonymity, the internet is as it is today, with so many people being able to speak out because of anonymity and pseudonymity. In many countries, or many cities, even in India, the queer and trans rights movements would not exist if it wasn't for anonymity and pseudonymity and the internet, right? Um, in many places, survivors of domestic violence, survivors of sexual assault uh, would not be able to speak up if it wasn't for anonymity and pseudonymity, which is available online. Um, and I think, which is why, like, I don't, I don't, I think it's more, uh, I, and I think, like, the, uh, the the conversation around anonymity has to be first from the perspective of affirmation, like, yes, this is a right that you already have, right? So when someone violates it, when someone um, forces you to not exercise the right, or when someone abuses the right, and by abuse here, I mean that you are violating someone else's consent, I think whatever um, legal mechanism that we have or whatever when we you know ask for um, uh, abusers who are, who are hiding behind anonymity to be revealed or like when and I think it's important that we kind of approach it from a consent perspective and a rights perspective um, you know like we approach it in the sense of right to anonymity and pseudonymity actually supports consensual use of uh, internet, meaningful use of internet, meaningful use of technology, and then move forward from there. Because I think when you approach, I think it's a very, um, it's really sad when we approach conversations around consent, around anonymity, around valuable rights from the lens of violence, right? Because, and in many places, yes, it has to enter from there, but I think it's essential that we move past that a little more so that then we can actually meaningfully use it to address violence which is happening online, right? And more importantly, this is a right which is also affordable to youth, to children under the age of 18. And by children, I only mean under 18, like legal wise. Um, and I think when we talk about monitoring and surveillance, when the concern is clear, I understand why um, uh, parents and caregivers may be worried about uh, children's internet use because there is violence which exists there. But I think, the approach to that should not be monitoring and surveillance because let's be honest, the people who are under the age of 18 are people who grew up with the internet much more than any of us here did. I know I got internet when I was like 10 years old or something. And that itself is a privilege because I grew up somewhere else. But, um, and, and if they want to subvert that, then they can do it very easily. But what is the main problem is that if you start by saying that you can't do this, you shouldn't go here, show me what you're doing, show me which website you're on then when youth and children face violence, then they will not come to you, right? So it needs to be a discussion. You need to acknowledge that children are not like entities without rights. They have rights. They have like, they are afforded rights as well and they can exercise that. So when you take it away from there, then then you, it may seem like you're doing it for their well-being, but that's not what happens. So I think this is something which we need to be conscious about. Yeah, and I completely, I mean, I completely agree with what uh, Smita is saying. So that is where I was coming from when I said, uh, when I was going back to sort of talking about a lot of the work that uh, I was doing in, in the past and will continue to do is to develop or curate online spaces that are rights affirming, that are trying to create rights affirming spaces for groups of adversaries. Uh, the challenge, and, and I do want to, I mean, there are real challenges here simply because in an online space, um, typically in an on-ground medium, right? When you're doing these kind of after-school sessions, and I'm sure Smith has done plenty of these, so she knows uh, the, uh, uh, the scenario that I'm talking about. But when you do online sessions, you, uh, you know, you have the, you can see a group of, you know, cohort of adolescents in front of you. Uh, you know their backgrounds and you're facilitating this cohort with some level of uh, uh, degree of confidence. Uh, when it's an online space where you're trying to open up this, the accessibility of this forum for a diverse group of adversaries and youth, 
uh, some of the challenges that we may run into is something like this, you know. Uh, and that can be, and there are circum, it is circumventable. These challenges are circumventable. Uh, uh, I would, I mean, in my opinion as well, anonymity is a tool that adolescents and youth who are from marginalized contexts can use to, uh, you know, empower uh, their participation in these mediums whilst uh, holding back personal data that they are not comfortable sharing at this point simply because of the kind of backlash they have faced in the past. So I do, I mean, I, 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 I believe in that. I think that you know, some challenges that we will continue to encounter and we, we should and unpack as practitioners going forward is in that personal data that is being stored, that you have the key to, because you are the, say, the organization that is, uh, you know, uh, erecting or making possible this platform, uh, then the protection of that personal data is really in your hands and for you to not, and, and, that, and the usage of that personal data for typical things that practitioners or school systems, you know, use it for, for like saying, uh, you know, monitoring and evaluation purposes, trying to understand the efficacy of a program and things like that. We need to, we really need to be very careful that we're protecting that data when we're putting out those insights, how we're putting out those insights, how we're representing these individuals is another real, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a real, uh, uh, I mean, it's something that needs to be thought out very carefully. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, also how you're sort of uh, ensure, assuring parents, because like Smita had pointed out, parents are gatekeepers that are constantly going to be monitoring online engagement uh, and onboarding them, you know, their internet literacy is, uh, uh, is, is, is perhaps possibly lower than the uh, Gen Z whose internet literacy, who grew up with the internet, not all of them, of course, not your uh, low, you know, uh, 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 generation of youth from economically weaker societies, but those that have had access. Uh, it is important. Uh, I, th I do think internet literacy is uh, important. And for practitioners such as ourselves who are sort of curating these platforms now, we need to be, I mean, we need to be accountable to the, uh, you know, to safeguarding these, uh, the identities of these youth, not revealing them, uh, being a sort of, uh, you know, proactive with uh, uh, creating other mechanisms that safeguard their experience on this group, because a lot of these kind of sessions, you know, the special sensitive ones that are talking about sexuality, sexual and reproductive health, uh, uh, you know, gender uh, are going, are bound to be exploratory, are bound to, um, you know, delve into uh, personal and intimate details. So the way in which that is being handled, I, I think it is a different ball game. And I think uh, uh, I, 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 I am treading with caution as a practitioner, and I do not perhaps see that kind of caution being employed by entire school systems and education systems that are moving to an online context. And parents that are also being sort of, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a way sort of forced to get on with this because the COVID uh, scenario demands that kind of uh, uh, migration. And, you know, right now, and of course, the uh, problem of uh, digital divide is still such a huge issue with the adolescents and youth, I mean, we, uh, you know, committing suicide because they're unable to be part of this. They're feeling socially excluded and not just socially excluded, but also excluded from resources like education that they had better access to when uh, things were on ground. So just for something for us to think about. Uh, and, uh, and now if schools are, you know, have, uh, have to start becoming well-versed with uh, intermediary liability issues, uh, then uh, it is, I mean, it's a time for us to be um, transacting internet education and internet literacy uh, amongst these stakeholders as well, um, very soon and very quickly. Thank you so much for that, Mansa, and for also raising a very important concern about protection of children's data. Uh, I'd just like to get some final thoughts from Radhika, maybe, on the issue of anonymity and then move on to something interesting that Smita mentioned about how we need to stop talking about violence and harm all the time and maybe talk about consent and autonomy and what this means in an online context. But before that, I'd just like to give the mic over to Radhika. Thanks, Devdatta. Uh, I also realized that I did not introduce myself in the first part, so apologies, I'm going to introduce myself half an hour into the webinar. Uh, but uh, I'm Radhika Radha Krishnan. I'm a researcher who has a background in gender studies, women's studies particularly. Uh, and I look at the intersections of gender, sexuality, emerging technology, and governance. So I work with the Internet Democracy Project currently. Uh, and here we work towards realizing feminist visions of technology uh, and the internet. Uh, so currently my research is focused uh, around the lived experiences of surveillance for underserved communities in India during COVID-19. Uh, and a lot of uh, 
uh, what I will share in today's discussion is also uh, drawn from the work that uh, the Internet Democracy Project has done uh, and has been doing so far on online violence, gendering, surveillance, uh, freedom of expression, uh, and so on. Uh, so, sorry for getting that in quite late into this discussion, uh, but also to take forward what is being discussed currently around anonymity. So, uh, thanks to all the speakers for their views on this. I largely agree with, uh, with most of this, and uh, I think that while one does acknowledge, of course, that there are certain harms that can come out of anonymity, uh, and uh, it's also in one sense, you know, the one way in which... Um, the real world may not necessarily be mirrored in online spaces because we were talking earlier about how, you know, a lot of those inequalities and experiences do get mirrored, but it is definitely a lot harder to be anonymous in uh, physical spaces than it is to be in online spaces. Uh, but that being said, I think that while it is true that it may make uh, it a lot easier for people to on one hand, perpetrate violence at the same time makes it harder to hold them accountable uh, to those actions. Um, overall, my personal stance is still that anonymity uh, is a good thing online and it greatly outweighs the particular harms that come about it. I think the other speakers have spoken about the ways in which we can, in specific instances, make sure that anonymity can be surpassed in case there are, uh, you know, certain, uh, you know, when we're talking about certain crimes, for example. Uh, but I think uh, largely anonymity is a form of privacy. It is a form of freedom. And this is especially true for marginalized and stigmatized identities. So people who occupy identities, for instance, such as sexual minorities, uh, we're able to more freely occupy online spaces and express ourselves, form associations in a way that would not have been possible without the protection that anonymity provides. Um, and, you know, even as I said earlier, Dalit women, trans queer persons, sex workers, etc., face higher degrees of violence online because of their identities, right? And therefore, for these people, anonymity can act as an enabler. It allows them to access and inhibit uh, online spaces with a far lesser degree of fear than they'd have otherwise been able to. So, for instance, when Facebook had introduced their uh, real name policy some time back, which would which required users to sign up with their uh, with their real registered names for their Facebook profiles, there was a huge backlash by uh, LGBTQ activists, by queer activists saying that you know anonymity is something that grants people the right to even be in certain spaces uh, so that is something that we absolutely cannot take away from uh, in terms of what anonymity provides and gives to people but also very importantly anonymity has allowed women to reclaim power in online spaces by posting about experiences of violence and by naming and shaming persons right i think this is uh, something that's really important and take taken off a lot more since the Me Too movement. Uh, and a great example in the Indian context is the LOSHA, or the list of sexual harassers in academia, which was a list, uh, which was a Google spreadsheet of professors that have uh, uh, harassed women students in India. Uh, and the reason that this list was able to come to light, the reason it was able to garner the kind of attention that it did is because the creator of the list accepted anonymous messages from many of the women who submitted these allegations. So anonymity allows for women and other members of marginalized communities to circumvent the kind of social restrictions that are generally placed upon them to reclaim those spaces and uh, not face the kind of violence that they otherwise would for speaking out. Because we all know what happens to women when they speak out about the kinds of experiences they have with their real names attached to it. So I think that is a particular liberatory potential of anonymity that is really important to center in discussions of anonymity, while, of course, finding ways to be able to circumvent that when it is required in the sense of trying to hold perpetrators accountable in case they are, you know, uh, abusing someone from behind an anonymous account. And I think the other speakers on the panel have already done a great job of going into the technicalities of how that can be done. So uh, that's my take. Thank you so much for that, Radhika. 
I think we can sort of move on to the next major theme that we hope to discuss during this discussion, which is consent. Um, consent can be a very hotly debated issue, and I think consent can especially get difficult and complicated to understand, interpret, and infer in online interactions. So I was just wondering, how would you respond to arguments that if a particular image or a video or a post is shared online publicly, it is then fair game for other people to reshare it or comment upon it? And I think some of my concern here also stems from the fact that how do we really draw a line between what is abusive and may require us to, you know, take some kind of action against it. Now, this action can either be us reporting it to the social media platform for it violating the particular platform's terms of uh, service, etc. Or it could be, you know, getting the law and police and courts involved. But I'm just wondering, how do we draw that line? Maybe we could uh, start with Mansa on this aspect and so just talk about how tricky it is to figure out what consent means in online interactions where anybody can reshare anything or take a screenshot or things like that. Um, I would actually like to illustrate it through a case study that uh, I recently got into a discussion with my friend about, right? And uh, this is a younger friend from my cohort uh, of, uh, you know, peer educators. And uh, it was an interesting conversation about Snapchat. Uh, and uh, how this person had undergone an experience when they had shared um, a, a photo of themselves, uh, perhaps uh, with, uh, you know, a, a, it, it was a, I mean, a semi-nude photo of themselves on Snapchat for a couple of minutes before reflecting and taking it down. Uh, now, Snapchat, as we all know, is uh, ephemeral content. The content doesn't stay for very long. And you can, uh, you know, you can also sort of... Uh, uh, decide who gets to view that content uh, so you can decide your audience uh, and uh, and this particular uh, you know photo was shared with a li with limited sort of viewership the viewership of this photo was limited uh, decided by the uh, person the youth uh, uh, you know colleague that I'm talking about the young colleague that I'm talking about and uh, yeah and, uh, and and therefore the person perhaps had shared for a couple of minutes before realizing that uh, they could not even trust these uh, uh, this limited network that they had chosen to view the photo, um, they suddenly felt a uh, uh, lack of trust uh, or some level of mistrust and pulled, they pulled down the photo. Now, uh, having pulled down the photo, they realized a couple of days later that the photo, um, despite ha having been pulled down, had already been screenshot uh, screenshotted and shared with uh, uh, wider networks and was currently circulating. Uh, so, the I mean, and I, and I really want to, because I was really trying to understand uh, where the person uh, was, uh, what the person was most upset about with this entire sort of, uh, uh, you know, when this was being sort of narrated to me so that I could better understand uh, their uh, perception of privacy. And I think it's a very interesting conversation because uh, the young person said that, you know, I had chosen the photo to share. I had chosen the, you know, the, uh, I was the model. It was my body that was being shared. I had chosen the viewership. I had purposefully limited the viewership. And I had also chosen a medium that is ephemeral in nature. Having taken, and these are precautions that I took to limit the publicness of this particular photo. So in their perception, privacy, I mean, that was the sort of like, that was the only space, that was the only, only medium on which the photo could be hosted. That was the only gallery that the photo could be viewed on. And those were the only audience members that were allowed to view that photo. That was the contract uh, between them and Snapchat at that point in the perception of that young person. And I think it really very beautifully constructs for me their understanding of privacy. And I think I learned a lot from that discussion uh, because uh, I, I mean, I, I am, I'm inclined to agree that if that is the perception of privacy, then how can we create an internet space that uh, allows that person to, uh, you know, uh, hold accountable uh, the taking, uh, the, the screenshotting of that photo, photo the sharing with larger, uh, wider networks, uh, the discourse and the narrative that is built around that photo when it is taken out of the context and shared with other people, when it is no more in the absolute control of that person, of the young person that shared the photo in the first place. Uh, and in fact, I mean, uh, needless to state that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, police officers and trigger, uh, uh, trigger, uh, trigger happy gatekeepers would have possibly potentially, uh, you know, uh, ended up uh, criminalizing the uh, young person saying that you uh, were uh, you intended to 
share obscene content you intended to broadcast obscene content and therefore the accountability that you you are the one that should be held accountable unfortunately in today's public discourse and i suspect uh, you know uh, uh, legal discourse as well uh, this is likely to creep up as a, a response uh, and it uh, it is uh, it is so it is so uh, uh, it, it so completely does not align with what the person the young person um, articulation of privacy was Thank you so much for that, Mansa. I think the example you gave is perfect for us to understand why privacy is really not an all-or-nothing concept. It's not that just because something is shared on a public platform or shared, you know, in a public space, it's suddenly fair game for anybody. That it highly depends on the nature of the content that's being shared, the context it's being shared in, etc. So, Apar, I think I'd like to come to you next. I was just wondering that because you've been a lawyer and you've engaged extensively with uh, provisions relating to cybercrime under the Indian Penal Code and under the Information Technology Act, do you think our laws reflect this kind of a mature, evolved, and contextual understanding of consent, or do you think, as Mansa mentioned earlier, right, like it's all focused on things like, oh, this is obscene, this is this goes against our conventions and our morality, etc. So, uh, uh, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, the short answer is no. The law, uh, in its present form, uh, which needs to be considered in terms of the legislative text, one, and secondly, its practical day-to-day -day application, which is the lived reality of people and their interaction with their law, is patriarchal and not two ways about it. Patriarchy is not only a system of uh, male assertion and power and primacy, it is also a centralization of power which reduces the democratic value of other identities and the diversity in society and hegemonizes that power in favor of one group. And this can also be applied by man against man and it's an investure of a very high degree of power which erodes human liberty and social justice. So the law is a patriarchal creature. This is not only me, this is what I've derived from reading uh, feminist thinkers such as Ratna Kapoor or even uh, civil society or advocates like Kane Biram, who set it out very, very eloquently. I'd just like to take one example to illustrate this and how it's even continuing today. So, uh, of course, I have my experience as a lawyer where I've pleaded in cases which do concern and tertially impact this motu towards content clearance and review of scripts and creative materials, which was a large amount of the work I did on free expression, which made me well acquainted with the provisions under the Indian Penal Code, a colonial, colonial enactment with Victorian values, which has uh, prohibitions on uh, adultery, which was struck down, um, which had prohibition on offending the modesty of a woman, so um, well, which has uh, even provisions on obscenity, which uh, arise not from the principle of consent or from preventing um, non-consensual image-based abuse, but proceed from a very Victorian sensibility. And even the modern day standards, which have been evolved by courts, let's say in the Aviq Sarkar judgment, where Boris Becker and his wife, um, which is an interracial couple posing with a baby, she's also a model, and it was in the Sports Star magazine as a center spread, um, that was uh, alleged to be obscene. And we've engaged recently with the parliamentary committee. We've made these points that young people have different mores. Law needs to change. But to our disappointment, the committee has, in fact, uh, this is a special committee of parliament. It's re-emphasized the uh, impact of what it calls pornography on young people. This is not to say pornography consumption is not having an impact on young people, but the scientific literature on that is very diverse. But it does indicate that again, content production by itself is displaying patriarchal values in which there is a power relationship in which uh, uh, in which a 
uh, couple or it's from the perspective of a cisgendered man, if I would just put it like that. So the law is not moved from society, the society is framing the law and the lived reality of the law in fact is actually what needs to be focused on. And uh, just would like to just add one thing. Manasa, thank you so much for sharing that practical experience by that young person. I think their understanding of privacy and how they practice it outline uh, online, in fact, uh, summarizes uh, that that those 600 pages of the right to privacy judgment by nine judges of the Supreme Court. So that's inherent wisdom right there in actual practice. Thanks for that, Apar. I think one particular stakeholder which has been missing from our discussion so far has been social media platforms themselves. Um, I was just wondering to what extent do all of you think social media platforms should adopt a more proactive strategy towards addressing online abuse and harassment and what can they do to improve their responses? Maybe we will start on this question with uh, Mansa, and then I would also really like it if Smita and Radhika could chip in. I'm sorry, you'll have to read the question again. Oh, sorry. My question was, what do you think social media platforms can do to more proactively address issues like online abuse and harassment? What are they feeling at right now and how can they do it better? Mm. Would somebody else like to go first? I need to think a little bit. And like, I mean, I, you know, until now I had a sort of a thought, a different thought going on. So let me just sort of come back to this question if anybody else would like to jump in at this point. Radhika, would you maybe like to go next? Hi, thanks. Uh, I think, so I'm going to like recount a personal experience I had recently on Twitter to sort of portray where the gaps are and therefore show where social media platforms really need to do much, much better. Um, so uh, very recently, earlier this year, for some reason, some pictures of mine uh, from a pride parade many many years ago uh, suddenly resurfaced online and uh, they uh, i mean i was wearing very uh, clothes that uh, let's say are very uh, you know typically worn at pride parades and uh, i think uh, what ended up happening is they ended up going really viral uh, so for instance uh, there were whatsapp forwards that were made out of those pictures with really uh, demeaning captions and homophobic captions about me. They were shared thousands of times on Twitter. Uh, they reached pornography portals on Reddit. Uh, there were like Telegram groups that were made where these pictures were being shared uh, and very derogatory comments were being made about me. There were entire uh, Facebook groups that were made just to share these pictures online. And I didn't even know which social media platform to start uh, you know, with to try to get these pictures down because I had to fight like on all fronts. And um, the least I could do is make this, you know, a bunch of friends, uh, like a bunch of my friends decided that they'd help me in reporting these pictures. So uh, let's take Twitter, for example. Now we uh, reported as many of the pictures that we could. And each of these pictures had very clearly uh, abusive captions attached to them, right? And uh, we reported them under various categories that were available on Twitter. We pretty much reported them under every single category that we could even find. Uh, uh, and well, Twitter did not find any of them to violate their community guidelines. Uh, how can that be, right? So we kept trying this, it didn't work. Now acknowledging my privilege in being able to do this, I wrote personally to the public policy team at uh, at Twitter, and I told them that uh, you know I shared links of like various uh, images and posts that had put up, and I told them that that were being put up, and I told them that I have left the platform for a while now. It's affected my mental health severely. Um, could you please take these images down because there seems to be no action from Twitter's end uh, about it, and. Um, they asked me to share a lot of unnecessary details about uh, uh, about the whole incident. I reshared everything with them. 
And at the end of one month of this conversation with their public policy team, uh, nothing came out of it, right? So those images are like, they are still there on Twitter. They're still there on the internet for people to see. And I had no idea what to do about it. Uh, so one thing that really needs to be done is better content moderation in the sense that when at least users, first of all, it becomes really difficult for users to constantly report these images. But uh, I would not recommend an automation for this because uh, what automation misses is context. And sometimes images that women might put up uh, because they want to, you know, uh, because they want to sort of uh, say that this is my body, this is something I'm happy putting up online can be construed as offensive or as vulgar uh, by the automated algorithm, by artificial uh, intelligence and so on. And therefore, um, there always has to be a human in the loop that is uh, for certain and complete automation is not the solution for this. But the least and the absolute least that can be done is that when users are reporting content that is clearly like not even on the gray, it's clearly abusive. There has to be action that is taken seriously. I think the people who work in these uh, spaces either do not take it seriously because even when this was brought to their direct attention, nothing was done about it. At the same time, there needs to be better like policies that even like a lot of the times when I was uh, a lot of the times when I was reporting these images, there was no option for me to even mention why I was reporting it. It was just like, you know, a series of tick boxes I had to put in. I had to like tick whatever, uh, whichever option fit the abuse description best. But I could not talk about why that was abusive. Uh, and a lot of it was in non-English languages. So I think moderators were not even familiar with those kinds of slurs in those contexts. So there has to be uh, a lot of, uh, you know, diversity in terms of even who are the people who are moderating uh, these kinds of social media uh, uh, spaces. Uh, there have to be humans in the loop. And we definitely need sort of more care imbued in the process of content moderation on uh, social media, which we do not see right now. Thank you for that, Radhika. Mansa, would you like to add to that now? Or if Smita would like to go first. Mansa, maybe just go ahead. Mansa can go first. Okay, I can, I can just say I really have something very, uh, I remember, and this is something also that uh, I urge other people to sort of go up and read in the audience. Uh, I just realized, by the way, that this is not a private chat. We are also public uh, family. See, the publicness of it was not uh, immediately apparent to me. It, I got uh, sidetracked, uh, but I'm all misguided. Uh, but I think, uh, I think that is, I think, one, one of an important point, right? That the the problem is again, we come back to perception. The perception of uh, what you, who you think is the witness, who you think, you, you think users, internet users, typically young internet users, would like to conveniently believe that they are completely in control of who is consuming their content as well, right? But sometimes, I mean, and, and it's also because of a lack of internet literacy in general. Uh, and to go back to then the point that uh, Smita was raising on who are the people that design these uh, platforms, who are the people that are continuously monitoring these platforms or moderating or regulating these platforms, who are developing the norms that govern these platforms are all important questions that we perhaps don't think enough about because they are not visible. These are invisible backend operations and that really can be misguiding for young people. Uh, so that goes back then to the, you know, the case study that I was uh, uh, illustrating in my previous comment where uh, uh, the young person thought that their content was ephemeral and therefore, when if taken down immediately, may not impact them in the ways that it did end up impacting them. And so that, and, and you know, and similarly, uh, Radhika might have thought, I mean, hoped that that content could be deleted and forgotten. And that brings me to the, you know, I remember there was this fascinating, uh, a lot of conversation around right to forget. Uh, I think uh, in 2015, 2016, I do believe that some... Uh, countries went forward and tried to build a policy around the right to forget on the internet. And I just, I mean, I, I wonder when the 
Indian uh, sort of discourse on digital uh, uh, interactions will uh, develop to that degree and really try to articulate uh, who, I mean, uh, if, if at all it is, uh, you know, it, is, uh, it, it can translate in the online space where I put out something and I want it to be forgotten. But by that time, if it has slipped out of my control, can I reclaim my right to that content that was originally mine? Uh, that was originally intended for XYZ audience, that was originally intended only for a certain platform. Uh, you know, I, 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 I wonder if we can, uh, we can develop our internet uh, uh, discourse to that extent, and I'm sure some of you have already been part of those kind of conversations, but uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe it's just uh, uh, new to me because I'm an outsider from typical internet legislation. Suda, please go ahead. Um, I think like Radhika and Mansa have said like quite a bit of what I wanted to share. I think one last thing that I would like to add is that one, uh, without doubt, like the onus has to be placed on social media platforms and internet intermediaries because uh, it is their space, right? And uh, it's also important to recognize that why is their reporting and moderation so bad, no? It is a very capitalist agenda behind it. You wanted to expand to countries very fast because there was, well, there's sheer number of people like here. Or you wanted to expand to countries like, like this happened with Facebook in Myanmar where they wanted to expand there because people were getting onto the platform. There was a language available. But for the longest time, they had one moderator for the whole country. And uh, this is what led to an exasperation of anti Rohingya Muslim sentiments there. Uh, in India, again, there's a ridiculously low number of moderators who are actually looking at content, human moderators, right? Uh, the owners very much has to be placed on the social media platforms. Second is that it cannot be a static set of guidelines that you use to measure what is violent and what is not. It has to be dynamic. When some reporter is reporting something to you as abusive, it's essential that you take notice of that, right? And if it doesn't meet your community standards and still someone is saying that it's a problem, there needs to be a mechanism in place to moderate that, to understand what's happening there, to address it better. Uh, I think one of the key problems is also that um, when we think about, and this is with, uh, this has something to do with um, um, privacy as well, right? Um, uh, Dr. Anya from uh, Internet Democracy Project has a fantastic piece of research looking at bodies as data, right? And in that, she speaks about how like the way we see our bodies has evolved so much more today, where it's not just the offline body, this body of ours, which is, you know, part of our body and ourselves, but also uh, what exists online is also part of our identity. Part of our body. So, um, and she has a fantastic question of like, you know, does your body and where skin touches air or does it go beyond that? So when you look at a uh, social media platform, they are very swift in taking down copyright violations immediately. Right. Uh, if anyone has used a song, um, which is in YouTube's case, uh, even if the song is playing in the background on a radio or something, they'll take down the video immediately. But why is the swiftness not there when you're addressing instances of gender-based violence? Right. This swiftness is also relatively there when you are addressing child sexual abuse material. Right. Um, uh, and, and rightly so, it should be there, but I don't, the, the problem is that gender-based violence, non-consensual sharing of images, um, it, it takes a backseat when you, uh, when, uh, when it comes to social media platforms for some reason. I mean, we know the reason, but you know. Um, and I think, you know, if we adopt the idea, if we place consent and the idea of bodies as, as our bodies online as our bodies as well, then I think the conversation on consent as well as the kind of pressure which we can put on social media platforms can also move further ahead. Because right now they're just looking at your profile on Facebook or your photos online as just photos, as just profile, right? But when you say that my consent has been violated, this is part of my body, this is part of my existence, and it has been violated. This is, this is online violence, this is online assault. Um, and I think that is an important kind of shift maybe which we need to bring. But there is, and, and another thing is also that not all people who face violence online would want the same kind of solutions, right? Um, similar to how not all people who face violence or sexual harassment at workplace um, would require the same kind of solutions in the offline space. Some people may just want to report it anonymously. Some people may want to 
um, you know, take it to the police. And there needs to be space for this within the conversations on on, on online safety as well, because uh, this this dynamicness has to be there. You cannot say that we will take the profile off for everyone. No, sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you just want that person to stop harassing. Sometimes you want that person to be muted, right? And and there needs to be space for these things to happen. Usually, otherwise, what's happening is that any conversation on consent online, on privacy online, on on um, what do you say? Uh, on on safety online is always in the black or white, and it's not such a binary. Um, but and and this is also a problem which needs to be addressed because they use algorithms to monitor a lot of abuse that happens. And algorithms think in black or white. One and two, what kind of data sets are fed into the algorithm is another question, right? If they are going to only show abusive words in English or Hindi, then half of India is gone. More than half of India is gone. Right. And, and if you and you put in like elements such as like you write a Tamil abusive word in English in Roman alphabets. Right. And it's harder to track that. So unless they expand and diversify the people who are moderating, diversify the people who are building their policy guidelines, their community guidelines, till then this will not change. And that is something which I think we need to push for as a, at a, for a change at a macro level so that it's sustainable change and not just a one off incident. Right. Thank you so much for that, Smita. You bringing up copyright actually reminded me of like an interesting fact that in fact a lot of women, and this is not true in the Indian context, this is largely true in the American context, maybe some other Western nations, but a lot of women who face image-based sexual abuse with their partners leaking intimate images, etc., actually have to resort to copyright uh, infringement notices to get it take it taken down. Because websites tend to be much more responsive if you are to claim that you know, this particular image violates my copyright rather than you saying that, oh, this violates my privacy or dignity or it's a crime. Unfortunately, that's not an option for all women because you're a copyright holder only if you are the one who's taken the photograph. But say if your partner took the photograph or if somebody else took the photograph, then suddenly you don't have copyright and that's not an option available to you. Um, it's also interesting what you and Radhika earlier as well mentioned about vernacular languages. Because, I mean, it really does seem to be some kind of a blind spot where social media platforms are still trying to govern and moderate content on their platforms in accordance with certain, you know, Western ideas of what is abusive and what kind of language and words need to be spoken for. So that was extremely helpful. And I think you've also taken us towards uh, the last segment of our discussion, which is about solutions. But I think before we get into this, I would like to ask maybe Radhika and of course, please others also feel free to pitch in. What kind of solutions do you think we should be looking at, number one? Two, why do you think these solutions need to go beyond the law and also look at other aspects of our culture, our society, etc.? Thanks for the question, Devata. Uh, so I would not be able to respond much about the legal aspects of this because that's not what my background is in. But uh, also speaking from what we hear a lot from the grassroots uh, when we speak to women's organizations, for example, um, what we hear quite often is that, uh, you know, law is not the most preferred option for uh, women, for a lot of women uh, when it comes to responses to violence. And I think some of the reasons for this have already been uh, discussed in, in the discussion today. So, for instance, one reason is that legal institutions are often, uh, they are very difficult to navigate. They are long drawn, uh, very expensive as well. Uh, and they're filled with a lot of very patriarchal attitudes uh, throughout from end to end, from the point where a woman has to file a complaint uh, to the evidence collection, uh, their interactions with police officers, lawyers, etc. Uh, so therefore, law tends to not be the most preferred option for women in uh, everyday engagements. Uh, and secondly, as Upper was mentioning earlier, um, the law itself can be a site for patriarchy. I think Smita also can speak more to that because I know they have a wonderful report on uh, Section 67 of the IT Act and how, you know, though it can be used to respond to online violence, it's also extensively been used for curtailing uh, free speech, for criminalizing political speech, etc. Uh, so uh, while it's also difficult to navigate the law, the law itself 
also in many cases is quite problematic. But I also want to respond to this on a more fundamental level. Uh, and I think Smita also did, uh, did speak a little bit about this in their previous response. Uh, and that is that, you know, justice means different things to different people. So in a lot of cases, women don't want to take legal action in response to online violence, uh, especially, especially given how pervasive it is. Now, if now I, I receive death threats and rape threats every day on Twitter. If I had to go behind every single person legally to take action, I would be exhausted. It's a personal choice for me to not want to navigate this through the law. And I think women are often demonized for that, for making that kind of a choice, because we're always told, why didn't you go to the law? You know, why didn't you file a police complaint without understanding how difficult it is or just like the fact that one may not want to in many circumstances. So what just so if I'm a woman who is OK with just muting someone or OK with just blocking someone, reporting someone and then putting it out of my mind and moving on, I think that's a valid choice. And what justice means to that woman in that situation is a very complex question. It is something that cannot be answered by anyone other than the woman in that particular situation herself, which is also why it is so important for us to center the choices, the rights, the needs uh, of women in, and of women, I mean, survivors in our responses to these kinds of crimes. So uh, that's why uh, there is a need to look beyond non-legal, uh, to, sorry, to look towards non-legal remedies and beyond legal uh, remedies for uh, things like online violence. And I think women do that on a day-to-day -day basis uh, anyway. So a uh, lot of times when online abuse is, uh, uh, is afflicted, and this is something that, uh, the, again, the Internet Democracy Project has done a lot of research on. Uh, it's available in a report called Don't Let It Stand, uh, where they look at uh, various uh, sort of um, strategies that women use in their day-to-day -day lives in negotiating these kinds of instances. So women could choose to just ignore the abuser, uh, block the abuser, report abuse, uh, name and shame the person, which is something that's, uh, uh, of course, not available to all women because of uh, the different spaces of privilege that we uh, exist in. Uh, but uh, some women can also choose to troll back. So if you're trolled, uh, on, trolled uh, online, uh, you can choose to fight back. Um, and there's also valid methods of self-censorship where I can just want to keep my profile private. Now, a lot of these remedies do put the onus of uh, the change uh, and of, uh, you know, uh, making, uh, of initiating these remedies upon the victim or the survivor. Uh, but again, going back to the idea that different people may have different preferences for how they want to deal with something like this. And I think what we must do is allow for all of these options to exist and make sure that each of the options is survivor friendly for women, that women are not judged for responding a particular way. And nobody tells women what to do in those situations. So, uh, uh, so Shilpa Bhatke has, and, and uh, uh, Shilpa Rane, they have a book called uh, uh, Why Loiter, in which they very excellently uh, explain uh, this right to take risks for women. Uh, you know, because uh, there is an understanding that, of course, we live in an unequal world. We live in a world where women uh, will, you know, in certain situations are likely to face violence. And we should, of course, make all efforts to move towards a world where that is not the case. But in the meanwhile, at the same time, uh, we must also understand that what we must focus upon is the right for women to take risks and be in that space in the first place, which means that w what we should demand is that if and when women do face violence, they should receive a right to redress without their circumstances or right to be in that place being questioned in the first place. So instead of saying, what was she doing there? Why was she wearing that? And this extends to online spaces as well, which is, you know, why was she wearing that and sharing those pictures online? So in that same online offline continuum that we were talking about, I think that that is what is most important, uh, making sure that we affirm women's right to be in public spaces, be they physical spaces or be they online spaces, 
of course also strengthen um, the lot a lot of the content moderation policies that platforms currently have uh, taking into account a lot of the things we've discussed today and focus also on the long term change which is that you need to constantly have more conversations we need better conversations we need more rehab rehabilitative efforts uh, to ensure that this is a slow change in the attitudes of people and the behaviors of people so the instances of such kinds of violence are themselves lowered with time uh, we need for instance sex education in school that uh, that teaches children what consent is that extends to teachings about digital spaces and uh, i think that some of these changes are of course going to take longer to implement than the others but they are all worth investing our efforts and energies into and uh, in the meanwhile of course focusing on how women can get redressal to these kinds of issues uh, you know without being blamed for those circumstances thank you radhika for explaining why women have the right to take risks i think i'd like to go to smita next because while i entirely agree with radhika that women do have a right to take risks something that i have noticed in both my personal and professional life is that women tend to not be as technologically well versed and that's of course because you know society tells you that as a woman you're not supposed to be somebody who's really into technology or gadgets etc and as a consequence what ends up happening is very often women don't know what are the right kind of cyber security measures they should be taking to protect themselves when they choose to express themselves so a simple example could be something like you know it's perfectly okay and we all recognize that a woman has the right to share her body and images of herself in any way she wants on any platform but maybe women would feel more empowered if they knew they could do this while you staying safely anonymous and you know that would require doing things like stripping the metadata of the image etc so smita i was just wondering what do you think about this and if you could share some practical tips that would make the internet safer and would make women feel more empowered Yeah, sure. Uh, I think the first thing is that one of the reasons why uh, women, uh, like you said, like well, there are, I think before even going to practical tips, there are certain things which we need to acknowledge, right? One is that uh, the technology, like uh, a lot of women possibly may not know how to use mobile phones as as uh, smoothly or 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 as um, would I can't get the right word, but fluently as uh, as. they are male counterparts it's also because when they are giving technology when they are given the technology is another element right if a kid is given pencil at age 5 and another kid is given the pencil at age 15 who will write better with it right who will use it better and that's the same with technology uh, and it becomes all the more complex because technology is not just a tool or a medium it's also a space right and when you are not allowed access to certain spaces when your learning curve is also much later uh that is one reason another reason is that a lot of the conversation and this is something which we discussed when we have um when we had uh sure uh, when when we did workshops is that um when digital security conversations happen they often happen in a very abstract very global north kind of way right and it does not and it's important that we start digital rights and digital security conversation from where the participants are if i tell you know participants who are in a workshop that you must move to signal which is a a, a safe encrypted uh, messenger service um and not use whatsapp at all they may do that for the workshop but as soon as you know um the workshop is over maybe within a week they'll realize that all their community their network their friends family is all on whatsapp signal will fall by the wayside what is much more effective is if we teach them how to use whatsapp more securely more safely right Excuse me. Some of the very simple things that you can do is that um, I know this may sound very basic, but having a strong password is actually a big deterrent, right? And how do you make it stronger? Is that instead of thinking of a password, you think of a passphrase. If possible, in a lot of websites, you are actually allowed to put space in your passwords, but it's not told to you, right? Try that out. That's a very simple, efficient step. When you are entering a social media platform, check out what privacy options are available out there. Ask people. right um on whatsapp you can go to privacy settings and even make sure who can see your status and who cannot you can make sure that you know anyone who you haven't added as a contact cannot see your display picture right and whatsapp uh, facebook now also has secure photo profile photo options which are there 
uh, when you enter a dating app, you know, when you're using dating apps, try to use an email ID, which is not connected with your other, you know, um, social media applications and try to use photos which do not reveal your physical identity, physical location and uh, photos which are not, which cannot be matched with your social media platforms, right? Um, try to avoid using Facebook as a way to connect to different apps right? and, and use email IDs as much as possible. Right. Sometimes it's just about also fiddling around on the phone. And a lot of times young girls and women are not given the opportunity to do that. That is also a major problem. Now, these are just very small key points. But I think at the crux of it, it is that uh, one, the onus of this should not be on the people, which is an absolute truth. Unfortunately, till we get to a point where the onus is shifted, we will have to take these steps if we want to take risks. Right. And the whoever is doing digital security trainings, practitioners, I would, the main key point I would say is that start from where your participants are, where your, um, you know, people under your care are, so that it's a sustainable security measure and not just one which will exist for this workshop and then it's gone. Thank you, Smita. That was very informative. And as someone who's attended a lot of digital security workshops and only partly implemented a lot of those recommendations, despite working at a digital rights organization, I fully empathize with everything that you've said and how difficult it is to just switch from platforms that you're so used to using, that your friends and family use and figure out something that's entirely new. Uh, I'm, very co I'm very conscious of the fact that we have very little time left. So I'd just like to move to Mansa. And maybe ask you, Mansa, what do you think are some solutions that we need to be looking at to address online abuse and harm? I think, you know, going back to actually a lot of the suggestions that I would be suggesting now are suggestions that I have uh, utilized in the section of reproductive health rights space, right? Uh, it's really, I mean, for me, listening to both Radhika and Smita, I'm thinking, I do think, I do believe that, and it, it is true, you see the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of uh, uh, messaging that these uh, social media companies also put out and platforms, you know, platforms with people. Uh, but social media specifically, I wonder if youth, adolescents and youth are even a constituency that they care about, right? Is, 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 and or how much do they really want to invest in this particular constituency? Do they view them as a constituency? Do they understand their development as a concern? Right. And I do believe that. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done there in our advocacy, right, saying that this is actually a stakeholder group that you perhaps don't identify as a value add. They're only and they could be a byproduct of your outreach, but actually they are a massive segment of your outreach, a massive uh, 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 what, what is the word? majority of your outreach. And you need to be paying a lot more attention to them and their lived experiences and their interactions with the digital medium and its ramifications on their personal life. So I think as a constituency itself, the second thing I really think that we should be advocating for is choice, right? I echo what you're saying. I echo what Smita is saying. I haven't been able to uh, do a successful migration onto Telegram. When DuckDuckGo Duck, 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 was a viable option for search engines, I mean, I did not migrate soon enough. There it is. We do operate in circumstances where these sort of, uh, uh, you know, monopolies are big sort of vacuum, you know, uh, black hole suction pumps, they sort of suck you in because you're, again, as young people, we are as young people ourselves, uh, social belonging and social isolation is not, I mean, social belonging is what we would, are inclined to move towards and social isolation is something that we would probably uh, not want for ourselves, right? Uh, so how do we, how do we move to a community where, and how do we sort of really ensure that we have more of a choice, uh, more of a competitive market where my, you know, and, and in that, in that process, the kind of and the kind of parameters we need to be looking at are uh, parameters of safety, parameters of rights affirming, parameters that are less that speak less technocratically, that speak less uh, to you know in neoliberal language and are speaking more in rights language. So this is a bit meta, but I do believe that uh, these are simultaneous actions that civil society groups also need to start investing in and start moving as this internet migration becomes the new uh, reality, right? And especially in the context of COVID. I cannot emphasize how important it is because people are just trying their best in policies, governments, education systems, everybody has migrated online and left behind huge media dark areas which are creating bigger inequities. So we really need to start uh, working on these uh, broad sort of uh, pieces that seem a little meta but really need some um, on-ground action. 
thank you everyone for this fantastic discussion i know i have learned a lot and i will be sharing a lot of these learnings also on iff's forum which is forum.internetfreedom.in which is where we you know share details about webinars etc and i hope we can take this conversation there forward what i have taken away from everything that's been said uh, is that we really need to center choice and autonomy and our focus needs to be maximizing choice for women and other marginalized individuals in different aspects so for instance if we were to go back to the example given by manta earlier about the young person who chose snapchat as a platform because the images were ephemeral we need to i think push technology companies and digital platforms to develop more mechanisms and uh, the technical features that allow users to exercise greater control over who can view their platform who can share their platform uh, who can you know screenshot their content etc so i think that's one very important thing also other things that have been mentioned uh, by speakers about how we need to sort of understand that this is the violence the abuse the harassment that we see manifesting in online spaces is very deeply rooted in our society and we can't just view it in isolation so that's been some great key takeaways um i do recognize that we are now out of time and i hope that whoever is watching this also was able to learn as much as i was thank you so much thank you devdatta for the moderation thank you very much thank you we're done with the live stream everyone thank you everyone bye bye Thank you.